welcome to Query Podcast. Uh, with me, I have James Russell May. He's going to be exhibiting at the Query from March 3rd to March 23rd. And we'll also be having an opening reception on Saturday night, March 2nd, from 6 to 8 p.m. Welcome to the Query, James. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to be here. And and you started your career in the Savannah. How has that influenced your work? Um, I would say it influenced me a great deal. I mean, I was living in Savannah when um, probably the most formative years as an artist when I decided to become a painter. And I grew up in the area, lived in the historic district of the town for, oh, um, from 1987 through to 2005. And just the, the character of the town itself had a great influence. It's a very lush and gothic city. You know, it's uh, laid out a very European street plan with lots of squares and these huge oak trees, live oaks that have Spanish moss hanging from them. It's a very romantic town. Mm-hmm. And plus, of course, being the art school there, which I, the Savannah College of Art Design that I went to, um, a lot of students stay in town after they graduate. And so there becomes this arts community of people who are very serious about their art, not necessarily making a, a living or even as their sole career, but they're very serious. And you, I probably learned as much from artist friends as I did from the school itself. Mm-hmm. And you made a move later on to Louisville, and that helped uh, shape your work as well? Uh, I would say so. I, my connection with Louisville, of course, is very different than my connection with Savannah, not growing up here, moving here at a more advanced age where your personality and your um, your goals are a little more set, possibly. But the move itself was very instrumental in enabling me to make a clean break with the work I had been doing before mm-hmm. and changing my style in pretty substantial ways. Uh, not to say that Louisville is not a good town for the arts. It's actually got a very vibrant art scene, surprisingly vibrant. I wouldn't, wasn't expecting it when I moved here. Uh-huh. And can, can you describe your style, uh, what the people that come visit the query will see? Uh, sure. I currently am working in a sort of... My definition for the style changes depending on my mood. Um, sometimes as a shorthand, I describe it as a sort of neoclassical uh, or a... Um, renaissance style, especially when explaining it to non-serious artists or not people who just aren't really that aware of the differences, so it gives them a shorthand explanation. Okay. So it's the approach I take is it's a much more traditional realistic style that I once used when I first began painting my I was very influenced by German Expressionism and early 20th century modernism and even though I was already a figurative artist my styles balanced those um, influences so as I matured or as I like to think I matured mm-hmm. um, I began to approach the technique of it differently I began to become enamored of the technique that those early modernists that I so admired were actually struggling against. So it's, there's, I became interested in the history of art as I became more and more serious about painting itself. And I found myself drawn to that, for lack of a better word, um, decadent art style, the academia style of the 19th century. And there was a sensation in that work not necessarily intended by the artists themselves, that really I found myself drawn to. It was a a sort of a lushness to it. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact that I was looking at this work through the eyes of someone who was a product of that postmodernist world that intrinsically changed the interpretation of the work. And it was that vague sense that really attracted me and began to be one of the goals in my own work. And it's a, it's a, I have yet to find the right definition, although I've been drawn to a literary phrase that I like called um, hysterical realism. Mm-hmm. And the materials you work with, I, I saw that you work with resins, and I wasn't familiar with that process. 
Uh, well, I I once did a lot of work with stand oil, which is a fairly traditional oil painting medium, although I was using it more in the way that you would use a acrylic resin, and I paid the price for that. So a lot of paintings didn't survive um, my experiments, and I learned a lot of valuable lessons about archivalness and about professionalism mm -hmm. that hopefully help me out today and I started using in, around the time I moved to Louisville actually around the time I started changing my style I began to experiment with an alkyd resin which is a synthetic oil resin it's actually the same material used in um, industrial paints and house paints around the mid-century it would have been the sort of paint that Jackson Pollock used if I remember correctly uh -huh. but of course this is a uh, art store quality version of it. And it's a very stable oil-based synthetic resin that I have been able to manipulate and experiment with and have found it very rewarding because it's the exact opposite of the oil painting techniques I use, mm -hmm. which in, require tremendous amounts of discipline and control. And when I use the resin, I have a much shorter time frame to work in, first of all. And second of all, no matter how hard I work to get it to do exactly what I want it to do, it's going to have its own ideas. So I have to surrender a bit of that control, and it gives, it gives me a sense of a natural process, letting materials do some of the work for you. And I don't want to say I give up all control. It wouldn't do what it does if I didn't put it in the right direction. But I might be telling it to go you know, northwest, and instead it steers all the way to the west, uh -huh. just to use a, a clumsy metaphor. Mm -hmm. And how do you see your work evolving from this point? Um, I've actually been giving a, a lot of thought. The last five months or so, I've been experimenting with a lot of um, different, slightly different oil painting techniques for various reasons, and most of them technical. And I've reached the point now where I'm starting to more think of general direction of themes, and I think it's a good point in my output to begin to do that. Um, I don't see myself changing drastically in terms of the material I paint, but I can see myself trying to expand that, and I don't want to ever become pre too predictable and too boring. So, and of course, I want to advance. The question, of course, is which direction to, to choose. And when you talk about themes, are you talking about something like you have in the, the Loves of Jupiter six panel work, where there's a commonality amongst all the work? Um, I would well, the Loves of Jupiter is a good example because that's the one that really set up my current body of work. Mm -hmm. In fact, I like to describe that painting as my graduate school because I had at one point intended to um, go to graduate school when I moved to Louisville, and I was moving to Louisville for different reasons. But upon getting here, I discovered that the university here didn't have a MFA program and like I said I hadn't moved here specifically for that but that was in the back of my mind and so I decided to instead concentrate on a particular piece I spent about 18 months painting that that series of thin panels and learned a lot about the painting process learned about a lot about technique and struggled myself through. I think sometimes I actually do learn better when I make the mistakes and then figure out how to correct them on my own. If someone tells me how to do that, I think part of my mind sort of rebels and it doesn't absorb properly. Mm -hmm. So that particular painting set up a lot of the themes I am still working on, a, a connection with mythology and through that a connection with the history of art and those particular stories that have resonated through many, many centuries from the time they were written to the time that they fueled the Renaissance movement in Europe to the present day in which people still recognize those stories. Mm -hmm. 
And what would you like to, for the audience to take away from viewing your work? Hmm, that's um, that's a good question. Um, well, I'm always curious to get people's reactions. I have certain people see my work and they come away deeply impressed with the um. Well, that sounds a little egotistical to put it that way. <laughs> they come away impressed with the the mythology aspects of it, and they come away. Like, I've had. Uh, collectors who are excited because I did a particular story that they're excited about. And I also have people who are just more interested in the technique. And so it's, I don't want to ever tell anyone they're taking a painting the wrong way. And it's part of the whole creative process, I think. Once you create something, you are. I guess it's similar to the whole idea of subtextual criticism, which I was reading about pretty recently, whereupon the critic examines a piece of work, imagines what the author or the artist intended, and then writes about that, as opposed to what the actual artist intended in the first place. And that, that sort of analysis is perfectly valid. However, it doesn't necessarily reflect any real artist intent so yeah i think i like the idea that people can come away three different people can look at the same painting and come away with three different takes on it mm -hmm. yeah. i like to have a little little bit of room for interpretation i guess mm -hmm. awesome well we're certainly looking forward to you exhibiting at the query and um I'm looking forward to meeting you as well. And, and at the, oh, same uh, here. I'm glad to be involved. And I appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk. Oh, no, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. With the Loves of Jupiter, um, it was six panel diptych, which I've actually, or six panel polyptych, which I found out is technically called a sextic although I decided for various reasons not to use that description, okay. um, is based upon stories from the Metamorphoses by Ovid. And Ovid was a tremendous influence upon the painters of the Renaissance era. Um, most of the stories he told were one way or another painted by many, many famous artists. Um, those were the first ones I was drawn to when I started to seriously think about painting mythological themes. Um, I had become interested in uh, the history of religion around the same time I was becoming interested in the history of art, and I had a childhood interest in mythology. I think a lot of young boys, especially for some reason, and have read a lot of the old Greek myths because many of them are so similar to superhero stories and heroic stories. So I had a strong attachment to those themes. And the Ovid stories, of course, were some of the most fundamental. And as I was connecting my interest in art history to my connection to my interest in religious history, those were easy, those popped out to me the most. So I began uh, coming up with an idea of a large multi-panel piece and just be creating slices of people sort of making extreme narrow focus on the on the stories themselves so be bringing them down to the basics and it sort of grew out from there um it actually, when I first started, it was not planned to be a large single painting. I was just going to do a series of small, thin ones. And it didn't take long before it would be much more effective as a group. And I could design them in such a way that they worked as a group while telling their individual stories. Sort of this denseness of information giving a little more weight to the, to the material involved. It's... Again, it's one of those stories of transformation which was so common and popular in the Greek myths. And it hasn't been painted as often, which is one of the things that attracted me to it. It's, um, it's a story of a nymph who is being pursued by a river god after she bathes in him without knowing what she was doing. And she prays to Artemis, who first hides her in a cloud and then transforms her into steam. 
And the moment I've chosen to represent is that transformation, which, again, the most dynamic part of the story, which is one of the things that attracts me. It's also a, a chance to blend my two different techniques of resin, abstracted resin technique and oil painting. Mm -hmm. So I always like when I have a chance to blend the two. Pythia is a very recent painting. Um, it's Pythia was the Oracle at Delphi. And when I is part of a series of paintings that I was experimenting with slightly different painting techniques. Um, and of course, when it actually began painting it, it wasn't about Pythia. It became sort of evolved through the creative process. I realized the feel of it and decided, and decided to play upon that familiarity. I decided to work the idea of the Oracle of Delphi into the painting during the middle of the process. And I feel like it worked out fairly successfully. It uh, uses metallic pigments mixed in with the resin to create a more otherworldly effect, as well as the hair becoming smoke, which is a strong association with Pythia, where the, on the Oracle would sit upon a throne with incense and smoke coming out from a hidden chamber beneath her. The Penitent Magdalene, um, another riff upon art history, many, many beautiful Magdalene paintings done over the years. I found this model and she just had this particular face that seemed to cry out for that. She, she felt like an old painting before I even started painting her. And she had that sort of sadness in that particular pose. And I had always wanted to do a Magdalene. Uh, my cat is named Magdalene. It's just one of my favorite names. And I like the idea of a sensuous female figure from the Bible, from Bible stories, which of course is the other great source of themes for Renaissance and after artists. Diane at rest after the hunt. Ah, uh, um, well, Diane at rest after the hunt was an interesting case of after doing the loves of Jupiter, deciding what themes to approach, what, how to mix my different interests. I decided on that piece to manipulate the resin into an actual environment as opposed to just sort of a vague, abstracted feel. And it was the first time I'd really attempted that. So I found that as an interesting challenge. Also wanting to, wanting to have figures interacting as I now figured out how to paint figures, paint, paint human beings in that particular style to have them doing more complicated things with each other, whereupon the loves of Jupiter had all been single figures interacting with animals mm -hmm. for a very different effect. Nice. Io and Zeus? Ah, Io and Zeus. It's, again, another story of transformation whereupon Zeus has turned himself into a, a cloud or a mist in order to seduce a beautiful woman, who in this painting is actually the modeled by my wife. Um, I had done Io and Zeus for the loves of Jupiter, one of the single paintings, but could not resist going back to that particular story. It's, there's a reason it's been painted so often, but it's just because it's a, it's a fun painting to work on. It's a fun painting to imagine. And I had a lot of fun painting it. It just, it was perfect for the type of effect I was trying to create. Oh, yes, Venus in Repose. Um, Venus in Repose was a challenge to myself that I made. I had been painting these figures mostly, if not life-size, probably at least three-quarters life-size. I've always been drawn to producing large paintings, and Venus in Repose is actually fairly small. Um, I can't remember the dimensions off the top of my head, but roughly about 30 by 30. So... It was an attempt to see if I could actually paint figures in that way. Every painting I do, I think, has some sort of personal challenge to me, or it has some sort of personal draw that almost 
impulse to create it in the first place. So that was pretty much the impetus behind that particular one. Mm -hmm. Well, Severance was, it was my big project of 2012. It was a, probably the most um, involved technical painting I had done to that point. Very complicated composition, especially in regards to the Medusa head and the snakes, but also with the entire arrangement. I probably spent about five months working on that painting, about 50 hours a week. And for various reasons, the time was just sucked into it. And it was almost meditative in that sense. It was sort of um, another version of A Loves of Jupiter in that sense, a very all-encompassing project. But what is always interesting personally for that painting is that the severed heads are portraits of myself and my wife. Meanwhile, the Perseus figure and the Salome figure is a couple that we know who actually just recently got married. So it's always fun for me personally to see that painting because of that. Yeah. And it was, again, it was an experiment in technique, trying to hone the things I'd been doing with the figure. It was a much, much more detailed painting that I had done in quite a while and just sort of pushing the limits of what I had learned a very I don't want to say strictly technical experiment by any means because that wasn't the inspiration behind it but it sort of became part of it that extra bit of work and dedication to it mm -hmm. 